Welcome to Opla. It's a podcast about Netflix's One Piece. <laughs> and, you know, the, the one that's not drawn on paper and the one that's not animated. It's the one with real life people. Made of flesh and blood. And bone. <laughs> and spirit. And soul. That's so true. Are we getting into the philosophical debate on souls right now or... Yeah, that's truly what this podcast is about. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I'm Steve. And I'm Vero. And we're back talking about more of uh, the One Piece live action series. And uh, we got a phenomenal episode for you today because we're not only just talking about episodes three and four from the series. We're talking with the show, one of the showrunners, Stephen Maeda, on the show today. It, it was pretty cool. It was, it was really neat to talk to him, actually. I, I was Absolutely, a little nervous yeah. at first, but uh, I think it was a great conversation. Well, Zach also joined us for the segment, and he was very excited to finally talk with Steven. And Steven, plenty to say. You know, he a very pitiful role in uh, the series, and uh, there's so much to talk about. It's a really great interview, and you should check it out. Maybe you should check it out right now. We have too many Steves. There's you, there's Steven, and now there's Steven. I'm going to start calling you Smeven. Why Why? Why that? Why Smeven? <laughs> it's the first thing that came to mind. To differentiate. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Take I mean, it I away, res- Smeev. Uh, aye, aye, Captain. All right, and then I think uh, Delaney could probably. <laughs> <I'm> sorry, <laughs> it's all good. I'm done. I'm done laughing. Okay. Smeave. Hello, everyone. My name is Zach, and I'm joined with my fellow co-host here, Steve. Hey there. The other one of the Steves today, and hey. Vero. <laughs> Hi. I I was saying before the show how we have so many Steves and Stevens on our <laughs> show. We have no name <laughs> diversity here, but I'm super. I've I've been uh, over the moon excited to have Steven Maeda here with us, the showrunner, executive producer, writer. Uh, lots of credits for the Netflix, Netflix's One Piece. Welcome, Stephen. Uh, thank you very much. Nice to be here. Yeah, nice to have you here. Um, I, I guess the first question I have to ask, since we are a One Piece podcast, I feel like I need to start One Piece related, is before the show, before everything, how did you find One Piece? It was Do you have a One Piece origin story? Uh, yeah, it's um, it's a pretty basic story. Um, I knew of One Piece, but I had not done a deep dive into the material at all before um, I heard about the show. But when I when I did hear about the show uh, and that there was a, a plan to do a live action adaptation, I read about it, said this seems really cool. Then I dove into the first hundred chapters and I just devoured them um, and really loved it. And I said, this is amazing. I would love to be a part of this. I read them again. Um, mm-hmm. And then just kept reading onward because um, the storytelling is so unique and so wonderful. So I was a late adopter of uh, of One Piece, but I consider myself a, a huge fan of the entire series. I know Vero here started. We have a lot of pandemic. Uh, we'll call them mm-hmm. pandemic One Piece babies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Read through the uh, yes all thousand chapters in a city. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm, up through, I'm up through Wano right now. I have not uh, gone ahead, but. Um, it's uh, it's it's a it's a um, a commitment, uh, for sure. But uh, <laughs> it want to know just to see where the storytelling goes is so fascinating. There's a reason it's like one of the only manga and anime I have time for. It's because it's a thousand plus chapters. Exactly. Um. So how did how did you first then get involved um with the production and and Tomorrow Studios and Netflix? Yeah, they um uh Tomorrow Studios had acquired the rights um 
uh, from Odesan and Shueisha. Um, and we're planning to try to launch this live action. And this was pre-Netflix pre um, involvement, but um, it was really a matter of, um, they wanted me to come in, they wanted me to rewrite a pilot that they had and see if we could get it over the, the hump with, um, with uh, Netflix. And we did, and that was a, a really, fun and rewarding thing to do. And um, and then the talk began in earnest and it was about two years, pandemic fell right in the middle of it. So we started out in real offices for a year and then shifted to, to Zoom after that. But it was a very long process of trying to figure out what version of the show we were gonna tell. Because obviously anytime you do an adaptation, there are many different ways to go um, structurally, thematically, how close do you want to adhere to the manga? How far away are we allowed to go? Um, and then on top of that, the big question, which is always hard to get a, a network or a streamer to, to admit to is how much money we, do we have to spend on this? And mm -hmm. it's a big deal because it's, it's very time intensive. It's very budget intensive, depending on which type of show you're allowed to do. And so th those talks began in earnest and, and there was much passionate debate uh, going back and forth. I could only, I was going to ask you about the passionate debate because I could only imagine you have a lot of very, you have Netflix, a major studio, Shueisha, which is a huge behemoth of its own. Um, and you have, I guess, Tomorrow Studios in the middle producing it. Uh, how was it uh, juggling all of the different interests that <laughs> that probably had very strong opinions about it? Yeah, it's very difficult, um, uh, very rewarding ultimately, but really difficult. And that is actually my job in a lot of ways. Uh, the, the primary component of my job is juggling those various interests and not just making sure that we're putting out the best version of the show possible, but what is that best version of the show? And how are we going to factor in everybody's wants and needs on that? Um, the primary difference being, you know, Otisan wrote, a thousand plus chapters of of a manga without really a thought to how it's going to play on television or in a season of, uh, of television and mm -hmm. for me it was about all right how do we take that and distill it into the best possible first season so that number one fans of the show who know it are not going to feel cheated or or like ah oh, they, they screwed it up and two for new people who new new fans potentially who have never heard of one piece before how do we hook those people in and tell a story that's not so inside baseball that it's going to be lost on the, the new audience that is seeing it for the first time? I can't, I literally cannot imagine doing that. I, I mean, especially, I think, I'm, I'm sure you're aware One Piece just was filled with a ton of skepticism about moving it to live action because I think Oda didn't have television in mind at all. Um, it was, it's such a cartoony world. Um, how, how did you approach bringing it into reality? I guess, how did, how did you, it's a, it's a tremendously, tremendously difficult show to adapt for a couple of reasons. Um, and, and some of them just practical reasons because it's a travel show. Um, you're going from place to place to place every episode mm -hmm. or every couple of those. So we, we kind of broke it into two episode chunks for primarily for new locations then you never return to those locations again, which is counter to everything that I've learned in television, which is you have your home set and your, or your home location that you return to again and again and again, or you have a handful of these perhaps, and you come back to them. Game of Thrones, you're going back to Winterfell, you're going back to, to King's Landing. Um, mm -hmm. On One Piece, you're not going back anywhere except maybe for a flashback sequence um, or for a, a little kind of around the horn like we did in at the end of episode eight, where we showed people again. But really, we're you know, Windmill Village was built for two episodes for the flashback and then torn yeah. down, which broke my heart. Uh, <laughs> Ratia was built for two episodes and and some little pieces and then torn down, heartbreaker oh. again. So it was a lot. That hurts. Of, I, I I want to go to those sets. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. I wish I wish everybody could go to those sets uh, in South Africa because they were so magnificent and the, the construction crew and the production design crew did such a wonderful job building those and just standing in them, in front of them and seeing the size and scope of it. You, you, it's, it's so inspiring. It really was wonderful. I feel like it would feel very I, magical. Like you, you yourself are kind of in, in the world of one piece for just a moment. Absolutely. And especially, uh, come on, being on the going Mary, 
Uh, I, yeah. It's a dream. <laughs> well, even I, I, I recall, Stephen, I, you posted a photo. Was this your office in South Africa where you yeah. saw the Mary out your window yep. every yep. day? <laughs> I could see the Mary and the love duck out the window. And uh, <laughs> it was it was absolutely phenomenal. And so I, I, I remember sitting there and looking out and going, what a great view this is. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, it was really cute. special. Yeah. And I was there for a year in South Africa uh, between mm -hmm. the prep and the shooting of the show and so it was it really was second home that's amazing too i mean even just south africa forget mm -hmm. all the amazing sets and everything that's that's unbelievable too um how was it how what was what was the day-to-day -day like um in south africa like what you know are there any uh moments that like still stick out to you i think over a year later right since you finished yeah it was a, I, yeah I, it was a year ago i got back at the beginning of september a year ago and then jumped into the post-production process. But the production process was at first a lot of a lot of prep work for a couple of months, a lot of meetings, a lot of location scouting and uh, finalizing casting and doing all sorts of stuff to get ready for the show because it's all about planning. Once you get the, the show, once principal photography begins, you are on the clock and money is being spent every single day. So there's always a lot of prep and making sure that every department knows what they're doing and how they're interacting with each other. You know, something as simple as when we stage a fight sequence, which has a lot of visual effects in it, who goes first? Um, how do we how do we do that in such a way that it's a it can be shot um, and executed in the the most efficient fashion, but look really fucking cool too? Uh, I'm sorry, am I allowed to swear on the show? Yes. Yeah, you can fine. swear as much as you like. <laughs> uh, so we wanted to look really fucking cool, um, and and it was really a, a huge coordination effort between our stunt team. The directors of the episode um construction and visual effects to figure out who goes first who fits in where and by the way we're prepping at the same time for the next episode and people are building things and rehearsing things so it really is a a, a giant army of really wonderful craftspeople and artists who are making this all come together um, not to get too much off on a tangent, but I know you worked on Lost and I was an obsessive fan of Lost back in the day. And I know season two, right? Is season two, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I remember a lot of the behind the scenes for that being kind of similar in that it, there were just armies of people that I guess in Hawaii, yeah. um, for that, um, I guess I just brought that up to, to gush about Lost briefly. But. No, that's okay. Thank you. I was I was a huge fan as well, season one, and I yeah. uh, got to be on season two uh, of the show, and that was that was wonderful. That was a that was a a difficult show to to write on, but also just such a dream. I'm sure. i for the different. The difficult ones are the ones that really I think pay off in the end, as this is a good example of. Yeah, um, but I, I yeah. definitely took my Lost experience and was able to take. For example, the flashback structure in Lost, which I liked so much how that worked. And we did that. In one I case. noticed. <laughs> Instead of front loading the way the manga does, front loading young Luffy um, or taking a break and telling an entire backstory. We do it with Sanji's backstory, but mm -hmm. really the rest of it was trying to figure out how to intercut the flashback story with the present day story. And also then the difficult and ultimately rewarding part, if you do it right, is how to tell a story that resonates in both the front story and the back. And so episode two is a perfect example of that, where we do the origin story of how Luffy, young Luffy got his straw hat. And at the same time, we're telling a story about the hat. Um, the hat figures prominently in the story in the Buggy the Clown uh, story with Luffy in, in the present day. Steve, I, um, Steve Yurko, I was gonna tell this story <laughs> when we were in Japan in 2019, right before the pandemic and we interviewed some of the manga editors. Um, I remember them asking, and please, uh, Steve Yurko, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they asked something along the lines of like, do American are American audiences interested in like that kind of emotional storytelling? Yeah, that's um, or right. Are they just interested in action? And they mentioned that scene in particular with the straw hat, uh, with with Shanks and and the and losing the arm. And how that they felt play is like a very emotionally impactful scene in Japan, but they don't hear about it, I think, as much in America. And I have to say, watching the live action made me misty eyed during that scene when it never, well, maybe it's just because I've been reading so long, but it never did. <laughs> 
for the manga or the anime. So I think mission accomplished on the the structure and everything. Mm-hmm. I'm curious yeah. if that was uh, a topic of discussion at all when the when the that those first couple episodes were coming to form in the script and all that. Is that does that sound familiar at all to you, Stephen? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, the first there was a, a huge discussion several huge discussions about whether the flashbacks or, or some version of the flashbacks would be in the show at all because oh, wow. they're very expensive to do mm. and you're you're essentially doubling your your production budget for those episodes or adding you know another third because of new locations you know, more mm-hmm. casting more time spent shooting those and uh, i was very passionate about including them if we could afford it we had to do it because they explain so much about who the characters are today understanding and seeing them and what they dealt with in the past i thought was it's so well done in the manga let's bring that into the live action as well and so they allowed us to do it i'm very grateful Absolutely. it's the heart of the show it's the heart yeah. of the live action show too it like really comes together not to spoil mm-hmm. for you. those who haven't watched for some reason at the end um <laughs> uh vero steve did you have did you have a question i want to no i just i couldn't I, I'm trying to like, you know, rotate in my mind who would even like be up to be on a chopping block. And I'm like, I couldn't yeah. imagine like letting go of any of those. So I'm glad you did fight for that. Yeah, that was it, it was it was definitely a, a struggle and and a good one, because that was something that if we could afford it, we had to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's too good. And those moments in the flashbacks are the ones that get me teared up um, when when I think about the show, because they are so impactful. They're so traumatic and really yeah. tell the story about how these characters came to be and you understand them i don't i don't know if you don't see nami's flashback how you explain what she's going through i, I think yeah. as as an explanation coming out of her mouth without the flashback it would fall a little flat exactly yeah i can't imagine and like sanji without yeah. that you know yeah. that's i can't imagine any of those stories i guess usops was the s- smallest but it was also really short in the yeah. in mm-hmm. the manga Right. And he has more really development. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, Stephen, yeah. I'm I'm curious if you're at liberty to say at all some of the things from the original story, the manga or the anime that you were a fan of that uh, you weren't able to fit into the live action at all. Um, I mean, Gaiman's Island would have been a fun <laughs> one to, to get in there, even mm-hmm. though it's 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 uh, a, a tiny little bit. It's something we we definitely discussed. Um, and I think the big one for me that, um, again, time and budget is um, fitting in Logetown at the end of uh, at the end of the first season and mm-hmm. just yeah. didn't have the real estate to, to do Wait, it. You also built the set for that, though, too. And so I think we were discu- I think we were internally discussing like, oh, they built the whole Logetown set, but they don't get to yeah. use it again at the end. Well, the thing about Log- Logetown was pretty I don't want to say easy, but. That set uh, for Logetown, a lot of it was VFX. A lot of the background buildings mm-hmm. and the stuff oh, that looked okay. like Florence was was VFX. But we shot that in a a really wonderful um, uh, fort, uh, old military fort in the middle of Cape Town, um, where they have these all these big. It's a, it's military, and so the walls are really thick, and they have all these parade grounds, and so all of the internal was done there, including the building that platform and putting our actors up on top of it. Um, so, so yes, we, we had that, but we didn't have to build the entire thing. A lot of it was existing locations or visual effects uh, after the fact. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I've heard you explain, but how, how did you um, find South Africa as the, as the place to go? I, it's a good choice. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. I just, yeah, I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah. It, it does seem like an odd choice uh, uh, for a pirate adventure. Um, it really came down to number one, they have a reputation for having great crews and great craftspeople there. But really, the um, the infrastructure at Cape Town Film Studios, where we shot most of the show, um, they had they were uniquely qualified to do One Piece because mm. they had shot black sails there for four oh. years. And so all of those black sails pirate ships had fallen into, into some disrepair, but they were all there. And plus they have three gigantic water tanks um, where you want to be able to, uh, some of the ships could float, some we just parked adjacent to the tank. Um, but Bratier was built inside one of those tanks uh, in the middle mm-hmm. of the tank so that there could be water all around it. Um, and so the fact that Black Sails shot there, plus our line producer, Chris Symes worked on Black Sails for four years, 
that was a huge determiner in going to South Africa. Um, and we knew we'd get a lot of bang for our buck um, there as far as construction is concerned. And we built more for this show than any other two shows I, I've been on as far mm -hmm. as our construction budget. It was uh, amazing what we were able to accomplish there. Absolutely. I, I still am upset I can't visit the Barati or that no <laughs> one else can, not even me, that the I know, public can. I know, yeah. it's really it's really um that that one was a, a really special set because it was just and the Ma special. well hope i'm hoping the mary is still there and the mary the exists the mary yes the mary is 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 uh not going anywhere good it's good i got mary. to get ice cream from the mary at dragon con well, so that was the like fan version yep. yeah. <laughs> and last we saw the mary that was in brazil I, yeah i thought i thought the fan version was pretty cool but mm -hmm. the real standing on the deck of the mary was was really special and then the other thing that was that was really cool was on the larger ships on the love duck which then there's a great story about the love duck doubling for the marine warship for garp ship oh. um, we, uh. we repurposed the entire thing and it's the same ship um <laughs> but but with a different cladding different you know paint and you know it looks very very different um when you stand on that ship which is not a quite a hundred a, a one-to-one i think it's like a three-quarter size which mm -hmm. is still massive you don't realize things like the deck slopes toward the center, toward the, the middle. So the back of the, the stern of the ship is, is high, the bow of the ship is high, and then there's a bow in the middle mm -hmm. like a banana. And it affects you standing and walking and looking on it. And when the actors are on those ships, it really is, I think, I think they really appreciated being able to stand on practical sets as opposed to being on just a piece of a set or on a green screen stage. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I could imagine that completely changes uh literal perspective it totally does um, and then you've got the sails and the rigging and all that stuff is some of the ships the, the mary and a couple of the other ships were on gimbals so they could actually rock side to side very slowly mm. um, oh, that's and cool. it throws you off you feel like you're at sea and the the sails are moving and the rigging is moving it just makes everything more realistic if we're talking about practical effects i also have to talk about the transponder snails which are one of my favorite <laughs> additions mm -hmm. when i saw that i'm like should have led with the transponder snails and the promotional <laughs> marketing. Yeah. Uh, what, I guess, not just that, but like the other practical effects, what uh, what made you decide to, to do that? Um, a couple of reasons. One being cost, because it is as expensive as it is to build an actual transponder snail, um, the vi visual effects on that would be much greater. So it's really yeah. a combination. It's mostly practical with little um, touches of, of VFX in there. Mm -hmm. So for the snails, for example, our um, prosthetics uh, folks who are just wonderful. They did all the fishmen prosthetics and uh, they built the transponder snails. So what they did is they made these snails able to be puppeted. So there's a hole in the bottom where a hand goes up and can <laughs> manipulate the, uh, the mouth and kind of move things around. So there is someone under that desk when Garp is feeding the snail who has been, the, the puppeteer has been digitally erased, but the snail, he's under there actually manipulating the snail uh, and then on top the of that yeah and on top of that the um we did a couple little visual effects things like the snail's eye stalks could move um mm -hmm. but they could blink. and so that was something where we were looking at it and going god it would be great to have a couple of blinks in there just to kind of add that most people won't even notice but it'll add a little unspoken uh reality to it and so visual effects stepped in and gave us a couple of blinks in the right spots um but yeah they're for those they're fully puppeted and and uh, uh, it was so much fun shooting them and seeing them, you know, just sitting on a desk. Like the first time you meet Garp, Snail's just sitting on the desk. It's doing its own thing. <laughs> Eating celery or yep, lettuce. Like, uh, yeah. Oh, God, I could talk about that a lot. Yeah. Uh, it's Steve <laughs> Rivera, I want to. And, and, and doing the different snails too, of course, because they all have different looks. Um, that was a lot of fun as well. Yeah. Uh, um, I think we all need one. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> so we also I, got, oh, I'm so sorry. Go sorry, ahead. sorry. Let me just go off on the snails for a minute. The other thing that we did that was really fun um, was we sort of took that snail technology and extrapolated on it. So, for example, when Garp is using his megaphone and hailing the going Mary, saying, "You know, surrender," um, we thought, you know what? If the snail is a voice transmission device, let's give him a a megaphone snail mm -hmm. and just extrapolate off that, even though it's not actually in the manga. Um, likewise with the, um, the little Bluetooth, the little, uh, the snail uh, pods, I love, snail I love pods. those snail yeah. pods. I think those are in the manga, but in a different fashion. And we thought for Nami, it'd be great to give her a little snail. And then again, 
animate it and do a little VFX so that it moves a little bit, has a little tiny voice, and it, it'll be something that people catch, you know, without really spending a lot of time noticing it. It's just a cool little addition to the world. Mm-hmm. When Vero Vero spoiled me on one thing, and it was that, and I was so angry because I'm. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I was just AirPods. so excited about that. It was a. It's it, that really like. That was one of the things I was most excited about. And everybody about. definitely everybody definitely needs one of those. We do. Yes. We all need a snail on our ear. I guess yep. maybe I should <laughs> correct that. V- Vera, I think, were you going to say something or Steve? Oh, I just, so I, I was circling back, thinking about how you were saying, you know, how, you, how much you loved reading the manga and all that. And I'm curious as to... Obviously, this is an adaptation of, you know, the East Blue events, but I'm curious if you took any inspiration from, you know, future arcs or anything in writing or, or putting putting anything in. Um, a lot of Buggy's talk reminds me of Buggy now, which which is fun. I think it is like a fun little Easter egg for uh, like fans of the show um, or, or like even the manga. So I don't know if you pulled anything from later or took any inspiration uh, for sure and um a perfect example of that is is the garp and kobe and helmeppo storyline which mm-hmm. doesn't come in until i think in the 300s uh chapter 300 ish or so uh and when cover were... stories too yeah exactly and yeah. so it was like uh, another thing i felt really strongly about was as far as things to change away from the original manga because it was an eight episode television season hey let's take the garp and kobe and helmeppo stuff pull it forward and let's introduce that early on. Let's put Garp on the platform with Gold Roger at the at the uh, in the in the opening twenty two years ago. Then let's bring in those characters as a pursuit, so it can feel like there's not just the pirate antagonist that they're running up against, but the Marines are after them as well. And it feels mm-hmm. like real pursuit with real stakes. And then it also gave us the opportunity to introduce that nice twist at the end of the fourth episode. This is a teaser or a t- teaser, sorry, spoiler, spoiler alert um, uh, about. Uh, Garp being Luffy's grandpa. Mm-hmm. I I love that that spoiler also for manga readers happened in two thousand seven. I think <laughs> yeah, you, you are correct. <laughs> I I think I I think it's just it, it's it is funny because it's East Blue and it I mean it was written in like in the nineties mostly. It's yeah, just crazy. Yeah. I mean I understand the spoiler you know Nami doing this or whatever it is you know but it's, it's just funny. Zach, yeah. my mom started watching it. My mother, oh, who yeah. doesn't like anime at all, so props to that. And I, I start talking about the end of it, and she goes, "No, no, no, no! Don't tell me. I don't want to know how it ends. No spoilers." And I, I had to be like, "It's been spoiled since the '90s, but okay." Mom, <laughs> <laughs> well, she also thought Close. they got the One Piece at the end of she. The season, she was course. like, "So they find it at the end of the season," and I was like, "You just watch that show, over. Mom. Have fun. <laughs> yeah, enjoy, enjoy the ride. Yeah, that's great. I, I, did... I love her stories like that of, mm-hmm. of people who." who were, obviously there there are two huge audiences that we had to please. And one is the fans of the show who know it really well and are, are gunning for it and really looking at, at, you know, am I going to be disappointed? Are, are they going to, you know, fuck up my favorite manga? And then the <laughs> second is people like your mom who don't know what this is and are like, One Piece? What, is that a bathing suit? What, I don't understand. <laughs> With a big pirate ship and a stretchy kid and snail phones. It's like, what is this? And if we do it right, we get both audiences in. If we do it wrong, no one watches. I was going to say, my sister did the same thing. Hillary Duff, I think, mentioned something about it. And sh- she's a 90s kid like me. But it's like, oh, you, the show that you've been talking about for 15 years is on. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. It's really cool. No, it's really, I, you accomplished the impossible by somehow pleasing both. I don't know how you did that. Um, I, I I had a, a very strong um, suspicion it could be done. But I didn't know. And so that was the thing about trying to do the version that was that was so wedded to the manga, but at the same time made enough changes to be able to really support the eight episode season. Um, and it was it's yeah. a huge risk. It, it, when you succeed at that, everyone comes to the table. When you fail, no one comes. And, you, yeah. you know, you, you, too much, you were too close to it. You were too far away from it. It's it's really a lot of alchemy of just is your story working uh, for both groups? And then also is your cast able to pull that off? And are all the, you know, in in every area, are you able to pull it off? And I knew the big ones for us were gonna be, obviously the storytelling, but casting was gonna be huge. Uh, And particularly if we got Luffy wrong, we were screwed. Um, And then the Mm -hmm. other part of it that people always talk about is visual effects. And that was the budget 
conversation. Do we have the money to really be able to do Lord of the Coast? Uh, and if we can't, we shouldn't do it. Um, you know, I know that one of the things um, that I would have loved to get into the show was Hachi um, because yeah. such a wonderful character. It was ultimately so expensive to do a Hachi fight um, that that we just said, it sucks, but we can't do it. Right. Yeah, it does suck, but I get it. it yeah. Um, I'm sure that's the case with a lot of decisions. Yeah. Um, I was also just thinking about how back in 2017, I think the, or 2016, when it was first announced that this was even happening, um, I think we tried to go in with as positive an outlook as possible, but even for, even going there, it's, it's that even if this fails, it will bring in, you know, new fans. Mm -hmm. And I think it is just, I could never have imagined back then being where we are today. And I, you know, props to, to to all of you and to Oda for being able to see that vision when I don't think a single, maybe not even a single fan could have because it's it's such Thank a popular series. Yeah, and that means that means a lot. And I especially enjoy the couple of people who uh, you know, like like yourself, who who were like, wow, I was really skeptical. I was really afraid that this was <laughs> going to be terrible. And you know what? It, it's not terrible. In fact, it's actually good. <laughs> <laughs> and that is that is such a nice thing because I, I get the fear. Um, I was afraid of fucking it up. So definitely <laughs> wanted to make sure that we did the right version of it. Yeah, do you feel, I was even tell. Yo, go ahead, Steve. Steve. Like, do you, I, do you feel like that was like a constant thing in the writers' room or just on set of like we have a lot to live up to here, or just knowing like just the the stigma with live action anime, or was it just more like, eh, you know, let's not dwell on that. Let's just you know. It was it was definitely a topic of concern. It was just it's in the back of everyone's mind. We didn't mm -hmm. talk about it much, but it would definitely was in the back of everyone's mind. We all know the track record, um, and and had great concern. It's like, all right, if we do this right, it's going to be fantastic. If we do it wrong, we're going to get, you know, crucified um, on this <laughs> one piece cross uh, like Zoro. And <laughs> it, it was it was definitely in our minds. We didn't brush it off, but it was like once you make the commitment, and you're like, all right, we're going for it. You know, we're going to do, I think this version will work. I think if we stick to as closely to the manga as possible in these areas, but we're able to modify in these areas to really support the live action series, we have a shot at getting both audiences. Yeah, I got to talk to the um, musician Sonia and uh, mm -hmm. Giona um, a few days ago. And the thing at the end, particularly, not just because of the music, but just everything at the same time, uh, realizing that, oh, this is a real thing and it's also One Piece is just this, not, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know, I'm not asking questions, I'm just saying how surreal it is mm -hmm. that um, that you were able to to, to get there. Um, it, it was surreal to us too. And uh, yeah. Sonia, by the way, who I just adore, they yeah. did this, they, they, they really went the extra mile for us. They recorded for us when we were auditioning composers. They recorded a YouTube video for us that was so professionally done where they were talking about the characters d demonstrated like a already a mastery of who these characters were and what they were going through in the first hundred uh, chapters. Then it played us themes from each mm -hmm. character that all then blended together at the end. And it's, it's very close to the, the music that actually is in the show at the end, but they, uh, they went above and beyond and, and we really appreciated it. I just learned what a hurdy gurdy is, and I'm upset. Yeah, that I yeah. Before. And it's perfect. Love the hurdy gurdy. Yeah, yeah. Per it'll be perfect for a pirate story. <laughs> I, I do want to talk about the cast too, because I think the one thing everyone was gushing about, and like this could work. That was the first. Uh, was seeing the cast. I know Vero. We're both also Emily Rudd fans and Yaki fans. I can wear all of Taz definitely. Vero. <laughs> um, not to put you on the spot, but um, how how was it? I know I don't know where you were specifically in the casting process, but how was it finding all of these characters and also secondary characters like Helmeppo, who really yeah. stood out, yep. and many many others? Yeah, uh, the casting process couldn't start until we were done with scripts. So once we right. we had knew what show we were making, we knew who the characters were going to be. Then we really launched into casting. We had wonderful casting directors, uh, Juni, Larry Johnson, and Libby Goldstein, who quite literally scoured the earth for uh for cast in this and it was we had a, a little uh uh help from oda son himself because he had written 
in his SBS uh, notes many, many years ago, mm-hmm. someone had asked him who the characters or what nationality would the characters mm-hmm. be from our world. And so we already had uh, Zoro should be Japanese, Luffy is Brazilian, um, et cetera, et cetera, down the road. And so we're like, okay, we want to cast this diverse. He drew it diverse, but let's actually go and try to get as close as possible to what he was saying in those SBS stories. Cause it's, it's just an additional thing that, I, that fans will really appreciate. Mm-hmm. So we opened up um, with Inyaki, for example, we opened up including, we looked in Brazil very heavily, but we also looked at other locations in South and Central America. And obviously looked at Mexico where he ultimately came from. With Zoro, we knew we had to find a Japanese actor to do this. That was a no brainer. If we could not find a Japanese actor, we wouldn't have been able to do the show. So uh, the <laughs> casting process was about finding these people who felt like they obviously wanted great actors, uh, obviously wanted people who looked the part and could could pull it off and then had great chemistry. Um, mm-hmm. And then the, the, the center point of it all was Luffy because if, if we don't get Luffy right, no one's going to watch the show. If Luffy fails as a character, no one's into it because he is kind of the center driving piece of everything. And Finding Inyaki was a stroke of genius from our casting folks. Um, we debated it endlessly um, and he just embodied who Luffy is. And, and Inyaki is that guy. He really is such a genuine, sweet natured young man and, and such a good actor as well. I, I don't know who else could have done it if we didn't get Inyaki. I think on one of the promotional things, he pointed the first page. This this came out before I was born. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's I, he's he's perfect. Yeah, Vera, sorry. Thank you. No, thank you. I just feel like it there it's some you know, I've watched movies and shows before where I'm like, yeah, I you know, like this actor, but I feel like mm-hmm. There's there's a running internet joke where it's like this actor could play this character, but this other actor could never do. That. I can't think of anyone else playing no. Luffy now at this point at all. So. I couldn't even before <laughs> like yeah. yeah like who is there what what a lister could could possibly embody that? I don't know because the thing about Luffy is that the the, the key to Luffy I think is that he's utterly sincere. He is so gen- he so mm-hmm. genuinely believes everything he's saying, and a lot of what he's saying could come across as really naive um or, or or childlike and he he has to do it in a way that you believe that this young you know man actually believes these things and that's the only way you're going to believe that he'll get other people to believe what he's saying and i i have said from the beginning of this show when i started working on it that luffy's superpower is not uh stretchy rubber power his superpower is that he gets people to remember and believe in their dreams and the fact that he can take a character, a cynical character like Nami or like Zoro, and get them to remember what it was that they originally wanted to do and follow him on this mm-hmm. quest, but the idea that they're going to be able to do that, I think that speaks to the popularity of, of the manga and the anime. Yeah, he's he's the main character that everyone does love. Like. Yeah. He's it's not the side character that's the main focus of the No, no, no. And he if, you, if you're not following Luffy, if you're not invested in him, then you're not going to believe anybody else would be invested in him. And so right. yeah, he's just a gem. He's the best. Yeah. Um Taz also. I I don't know if you want to go through each one. But they're all Yeah, sure, sure. Sure, sure. Um uh Taz was a wonderful addition. Um he he is such an interesting guy he's he's first off incredibly fit if you check his instagram you'll just see like all this incredibly dangerous stuff that he loves to do um uh that we had to have him not do please during the shooting of the show (laughs) we don't want anyone getting hurt um and uh he he is from the canary islands but he spends a lot of his time in london and just a, a remarkable athlete and and a great actor and again such a genuine person you know really lovely i did um, i'm i've done taekwondo and i w- watching the show i it was like one of the few times i think i've seen in television or movies like wow this is like actual martial arts that yeah. you don't see in american television very much it's it's right. really cool as really was really invested in two things about sanji number one really getting limber and and being able to stretch and get his feet up and around things and learn as many kicks and moves as possible so that Mm -hmm. he could actually do them on camera. And then the second thing was cooking skill and learning how to work with knives, learning how to chop things and how to make it look like 
he, he has been a chef all his life. Um, and so he was, uh, when Taz does research, he's in for the research. He was constantly cooking things and bringing over food for us. And it's like, Taz, I just ate, man. And he's like, no, 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 but you gotta Aww. try this. Uh, it was very That's sweet. Yeah. And the that food is was very good. cute. So, yeah. So Taz, Taz is, is uh, really special and, and I think did a great job of embodying Sanji. Um, uh, Emily was kind of a no brainer for us when we first saw her tape. Um, she just embodied a certain spirit that Nami had and um, was such a pro and, you know, showed up ready to go every day. And, you know, her, her takes are so remarkably consistent and so good. Um, uh, she's just a, a consummate pro and, and I think played Nami incredibly well. Um, uh, McKenna uh, was such a great get for us because we looked at a lot of actors. We had a lot of issues with, um, uh, accents and mm. not being able to understand even people who could speak decent English. Um, the accent made it very hard to understand them. That wasn't the main reason that we cast McKenna, but it certainly helped that he, you know, uh, spent some time growing up in America and, and spoke great English. But then the thing about McKenna that's really special, aside from the fact that he's a wonderful actor and has, you know, is so great at the deadpan, but then has this great comic timing where he can turn it on when he needs to, uh, and his fighting skill is is just unmatched our our stunt people were i mean they really work in partnership together because he brought so much of his own stunt work and his sword work to the game and he was constantly trying to make it better we can go faster we can do this we can do that um and we flew in a um a japanese uh katana expert to um uh, help with the stunts and to help help him kind of choreograph and help our stunt team cho uh, choreograph the katana work because it's very very specific and very unlike a two edge sword that you can swing both ways sure um especially so, in the mouth <laughs> exactly and the, yeah the sword <laughs> in the mouth oh my god the sword in the mouth let me divert divert for a second no please the sword in the mouth is a thing that i i had so much concern about because when you see it in the manga it looks really cool when you mm -hmm. see it in reality Oh my fucking God, how in the world are we going to make this work? Because the sword in the mouth looks great, but then you realize he's actually going to have to run around and figure out how to actually fight with his two swords in his hands and one in his mouth. How is that not going to look ridiculous? Right. And, you know, many, many conversations and a lot of trial and error trying to figure out how to do it. And there were many different swords that Zoro puts in his mouth, some that just had a little, you know, a grip with a little antenna on it that you could track for the rest of the sword. So that mm. he wasn't having to carry this thing in his mouth that was that was you know uh, three feet long. Mm. Um, so that was one of those that really concerned me because if you do that wrong, boy, is that going to look stupid? Um, <laughs> and I I think he pulled it off, and our VFX team pulled it off, uh, and the stunt guys really seamlessly. Um, so so uh, uh, McKenyu again, fantastic, uh, and then Jacob uh, Gibson, who just has such a kind of wonderful, lighthearted spirit, um, and. Uh, I think really embodies uh, Usopp in all of his fear um, and trepidation, but wanting to be brave and wanting to to you know follow in the footsteps of his of his father. I think that Jacob is is a very sweet soul who uh, that comes naturally to. It's great to see all all of you guys, all friends uh, on set and at clearly off set as well. Um, yeah, I mean, the cast, the the cast yeah. really bonded wonderfully in a way that um, you always hope a cast does, uh, mm -hmm. because there's always, you know, I've been on a lot of shows where there was tension between various folks and particularly between actors. And um, it's workable, but it's very tough. And this cast yeah. bonded together. They really loved each other. They spent a lot of time. Again, they were in South Africa for the better part of a year, um, and they spent a lot of time together and kind of enjoying each other's company, which was unanticipated but terrific mm -hmm. yeah i i think that's where a lot of the uh, goodwill started to come in from the fans they yeah. would see all these social media posts and i i can't help but think like you know i'm at least in my opinion i thought like the the key here is the straw hats yeah like they gotta nail the straw hats and just yeah. seeing their chemistry them just like hanging out and joking mm -hmm. out uh, joking around and stuff it, it started i got to admit like it started to fill fill me with a bit of confidence even when uh i'd, I'd be talking with people that were still very negative i i'm curious if if the the social media postings caught you by surprise at all they they totally did um again i i, I sometimes on set actors 
get along and sometimes they don't. And you have to figure out a way to get everyone to work and be professional. But uh, sometimes there's animosity and or, you know, hurt feelings or, you know, any number of things uh, that can go wrong between people. Uh, it was really gratifying to see them all getting along so early and then also posting about it, which I, I again, unanticipated. That was one that was not part of any marketing plan or anything like that. They just were on this adventure and they were posting about it and posting about it together. And I was just like, this is fantastic. You know, I wish we had come up with this idea to, to capitalize on that, but they just did it on their own. <laughs> Authentic Authenticity and sincerity are what I think really will grab the fans. So, to, yeah. And that's not really something you could plan for ahead of time, as you said. No. So it, it, the uh, other forces at work really just, I think, helped uh, helped all of that. Yeah, there was some um, nice uh, yeah. early, early social media buzz. Yeah. Um, I guess the last, since we don't have a lot of time, I want to also make sure that we talk a little bit about Oda-san mm -hmm. um, or Sensei or um, <laughs> just because I, I know a lot of our listeners are probably also just curious. Have you ever been involved in a project where the creator, I, I'm, I guess if it's an adaptation, at least if that the creator is so hands on, or was he so hands on? I mean, I think he, I know the he answer. Was very hands on. He was yeah. very hands on. And uh, no, I've never been involved in a project. There's certainly a lot of you know adaptations, but not one where the creator was so present um, in in you know opinions about the um, the direction of of the show. Um, I've said this from the beginning, it's his sandbox and we're so fortunate to get to play in it. it it's, mm -hmm. you know, Odessa's world. He created this thing. It is bananas. It's crazy. <laughs> the, the number of influences and things that he manages to tie together in a way that actually seems coherent and entertaining and fun. Um, there's a lot of people I know, I've read reviews where folks are like, it took me a while to get the tone where there are, uh, period elements, there are modern day elements, and then there's fantasy and kind of superpowers and transponder snails built in there as well. And trying to get a handle on that throws people a little bit sometimes, but he makes it work. And part of my goal was to try and figure out how to honor the manga in particular, because the adaptation is, I mean, the, the anime is its own adaptation of the show. So I really wanted to base off the manga and how to honor the manga without copying the manga. Because if you're doing a one-to-one -one adaptation, what's the point, really? I think there's, you know, you, you never set out to do that. But not to get so far away from the show that we were telling a different story. And believe me, there were budgetary concerns where we were talking about stories and breaking stories that were much farther away from what was in the manga. And I think it would have been mm -hmm. a disaster if we had gone down that road. But it was a, a budgetary constraint that we were asked to kind of take a, a journey down that road uh ultimately we came back to this version of the show and thank god i think mm -hmm. because uh, it would not have been as well received and i i, I believe that um Otisan's insistence that that we adhere to certain tenets of the manga was huge um yeah. you know fr from yeah from the very beginning he he had very strong opinions he knows the world better than anybody else we may not have always agreed with them, but we always tried to find compromise and to to make sure that we were honor, honoring the spirit of the manga at every step of the way. Because ultimately, there's there's that. If you cannot capture that spirit, then I don't think you've done a good job in adapting the show. Can you I recall think, yeah. a specific moment like that just felt like when you got that approval from Oda, like it just that felt like oh that's like we got him like finally yeah <laughs> no. definitely definitely the um the the inclusion of the garp kobe and helmepo stories was a, a pretty radical departure even though it's in the manga to a degree we were making that up you know, a lot of that whole cloth because we know from those those cover stories that kobe and helmepo do have a journey together on a marine warship but we, you know, they're single panels and they're fun and kind of quirky. They don't really tell a, a dr much of a dramatic story. Um, and we definitely wanted to do that. And so one of the things I was very glad we got to do and get approval on was um, having that Marine pursuit, having Garp in the story early, and then using Kobe in a way to parallel Luffy's journey so that mm -hmm. Luffy wants to be, when we first meet him, wants to be the king of the pirates. He wants to be the best pirate ever, Kobe, 
doesn't know this about himself or is too afraid to admit it because he's been beaten down, Kobe is on a parallel journey because he wants to be the best Marine that he can be. And so the idea that these two are, in, that Kobe is gathering inspiration from Luffy to be a thing that could ultimately be Luffy's, Luffy's enemy mm -hmm. was really fascinating to me um, to be able to tell that story and to tell the, to, and then, and then it was like, all right, let's put Kobe in with Garp and have them travel together in pursuit. Oh, let's add Helmeppo to that because they hate each other. And wouldn't it be great <laughs> to see those two actually start to come together toward each other? And they do at the end. And I think it, it's uh, uh, something that we had hoped would work. And I think it does um, in just making everybody feel like there is movement among these characters. They're going to a really satisfying place emotionally and it feels earned. They need to, sorry, with Helmeppo, they need to sell the Helmeppo teddy bear. I think that's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> that, yes, was, that was our that's... art department. And I didn't even know about that until uh, we walked the set for the first time. And I was like, what is this? And, uh, <laughs> and, came, and, and, and uh, Aiden came up with the blocking to hold it and, you know, in front of him because uh, he's wow. naked. And, that. and and by the way, that was that naked scene. I was like, I was like, he's got to have his pants off. <laughs> no, it's, and if Aiden's it's okay perfect. With it, he's got to have yeah. his pants off of that because it's it's just it sells how ridiculous how Mepo is. Absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. Not you, you didn't even need it, but it really it drives it home. Yeah, um, fun. we all remember where we were when we first saw him because <laughs> <laughs> we're at the premiere. And um, Aiden, <laughs> speaking of casting, Aiden is one of a number of South African actors that we um ended up casting partially out of budgetary concerns because a Mihawk, too, right? Yep, um, Steve. yeah, um, Stephen, um, uh, another we're, Stephen, <laughs> yep, we're everywhere. Um, <laughs> and and um, uh, Alexander Man Maniatis, who played Kuro, uh, mm. slash Montador, uh, also a South African actor. Uh, part of it was budgetary concerns, and we could not fly in the entire cast and and put them up. Um, so we're like, South Africa has a great talent base. Let's utilize that. And we found wonderful, wonderful people, uh, wonderful actors uh, to inhabit some of these roles and. Um, it was a nice mix of an international cast, but then also uh, locals um, who who were part of the the Cape Town and South African film industry, which is really strong. Yeah, they were everyone from the, the South Africa was amazing. Okay. Um, I, I I need to ask our usual questions that we ask every guest. I was um, hoping we would. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Um, I, I I almost forgot. Um, so first, who is your favorite straw hat? Oh gosh, uh, it, it has to be Luffy, um, hands down. Uh, although I love them all, um, but Luffy, there's something about him that I find, and and Inyaki inhabiting him, I think that I just love so much. Um, I love Zoro, and I love how Japanese he is because that's my heritage, um, and and the sword play, and he's so fucking cool. Uh, but Luffy, <laughs> is, is definitely my babe. Um, who is your favorite uh, non-Straw Hat character? Could be the whole series. It doesn't. Or yeah. Could be the whole manga too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, in in our show, I really love Helmeppo. I love what Aiden was able to do with that <laughs> character, um, and really take it to a place. He he's he's such a venal and kind of small petty <laughs> character. And Aiden took that character and really gave him one of the largest arcs in in our series. So that's that that's a fave. Uh, another fave of mine that we obviously didn't get to this season is uh, Tony Tony Chopper. <laughs> who I just think is so wonderful. I, I just love when I got to Chopper in the manga, I was like, what? Well, you, you know, who is this? What does he do? Um, and, and he's just such a wonderful character and such a sweet character, but but driven by, again, these great backstories. Mm -hmm. Speaking of not thinking of television or not keeping television in mind with Chopper, um, and that one will make you cry too. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, what is, uh, who's your favorite antagonist in the series? Favorite antagonist? Um, God, there are so many of them. I'm there gonna, are a lot. I'm going to go with Buggy the Clown. Um, That's the correct but, choice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, and that was something we really tried to lean into because Buggy is kind of a ridiculous character, but he's really dangerous as well. And he's got that great backstory and, and feels so slighted and put upon that, you know, we understand as with any good antagonist, you if you understand where they're coming from, you may not like them and you may think they're going about things the wrong way. But if you understand them, you're like, oh, I get you, man. I, mm -hmm. I felt that pain. I understand. And with Buggy, just that idea of being looked over and he's so defensive. 
Um, and we love Buggy so much that we actually conjured up the the storyline to bring him along as a as a talking head um, yeah. with the straw hats because Jeff Ward is so wonderful. And we just thought, hey, we, we've got to figure out a way to do this. That was another one that we really wanted to get Oda's approval on, and it was it was a fight. Um, that's a that's a fun departure. I, I yeah, really and, think and like yeah, it, it definitely was a, a huge passionate debate. Uh, about that and about whether Buggy could come along, and I'm I'm glad that uh, that we were able to to get the character in. I think specifically him departing Arlong Park is is one of my favorite Buggy moments of the mm-hmm. series. <laughs> and then, but then coming back around, the, the the other thing that I really wanted to do, I felt so strongly about this, was do that bit at the end of episode eight. Spoiler alert: where we wrap around and go back to all the characters, yeah. see them mm-hmm. again, because I love those moments. We're not the first show to do it. Um, I love those moments where you get kind of a little roundy round, you go around the horn and you, and you get a, a little pop of each character and remember who they are and, and that they were part of the story. Yeah. And with Buggy, the meeting of Buggy and Alveda, which obviously is canon, um, was something that we just felt very strongly about and wanted to see that happen again. And it's like, watch out. <laughs> yeah. That's that's one of my favorite parts of the manga too. They do the same, the roundy round, we'll call it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think the last question is what is your favorite story arc in One Piece? Favorite story arc. Um there are so many. I know. <laughs> There's so, so many of everything in One Piece. Yeah. Um I really, I really like Fishman Island. I think going into that story and again, something we moved up, which was yeah. the, the whole issue of um, uh, prejudice and oppression, uh, something that, that Oda has in, you know, in, in spades in the, um, in the manga, but something we really wanted to bring up so that you understood that the fishmen were not just thugs who were powerful because they want to be powerful, but mm-hmm. they have a real chip on their shoulder and Arlong in particular. Um, and I think, going to Fishman Island and and seeing that all play out and understanding what the world government has really been doing in this world um, was is really powerful. And so, yeah, I love that one. Awesome. Um, Steve, Vero, any other, did I miss anything? I think we're good. We're good. All right. Steven, amazing to have you. Uh, hey, you're always no welcome back if you want to talk about One Piece for another few hours. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a threat. Right. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it always is with us. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Thank you so much. Welcome back. We're talking about episodes three and four now of the One Piece live action series. Me, Steve, along with Vera. Hi, Smeev. <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot. That's not my name. <laughs> my name is Smeev. Um, but why don't we, uh, why don't we, you know, dish this out? Why don't we, why don't we talk the talk? Why don't we tell some tales? Oh, wait, never mind. Because episode three is, uh, tall is titled, "Tell No Tales." That was a good one. It was a good joke. Yeah, you yeah. Landed that. It's so good. It's so good that I uh, stumbled on my words. <laughs> it's okay. But yeah, for this, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, for this segment, we're going to be talking about the adaptation of Syrup Village, the Kuro arc, Usopp's origin, if you will. Um, you know, so I have yeah. I have one word for it. I have one word for Captain Kuro. <laughs> yeah. They should be calling him Captain Cunty, because like... <laughs> I loved it. Um, also, his like she they cat girl. It, oh, you mean Sham? Yeah, yeah. Um, they they're really cunty. <laughs> I just really like them. They're so stupid. I'm getting yeah, ahead of myself here, but uh, I mean, you you could tell right away that you can't trust these three at all. <laughs> absolutely. Um. But I, I think the the most important thing here is, you know, this is the introduction to Usopp, played by Jacob Romero. Um, what do you think of uh, Jacob? 
Jacob is so charming. Uh, I thought he was so darling as Usopp. Uh, he, he, he like, he has a little bit more confidence uh, than Usopp does, which I think is fine. I was wondering how they were going to play off Usopp's writing for the live action. Um, we, how do I put this? It's not my opinion, but I know this is a popular held opinion. A lot of people don't like Usopp at first. I think. I don't know. No, that's not. That's not. I. I wouldn't say that's a. Uh, uh, controversial take. I think. Sure. Yeah. I, I, think I think Usopp falls victim to the same thing uh, that I found with like. I'm getting I'm really extrapolating here. Uh, like some Evangelion characters, where people tend to dislike the characters that are reflections of themselves. Um, and Usopp is like the reflection of of the reader as like the everyman who doesn't have any special powers. Um, and honestly, probably would be terrified um, when confronting the horrors of of the the sea, where everybody's got powers and there's giant monsters and people can I don't know use hockey. You just look at a guy and he dies. That's fucking crazy, bro. Um, and I think people don't like seeing that in their shout in. Um, and then like Usopp kind of grows um, to grow confidence in himself, which great. But uh, <laughs> anyway. I'm getting off topic. I'm this is turning into a dissertation on Usopp and why I'm like, yeah, I think people are too mean. No, that's um, no, that's fine. I but, definitely. Oh, go ahead. I would say that you know Usopp kind of rese- uh, resembles like the the modern day pathological liar you might come across, where uh, definitely um, laying in the uh, confidence and the swagger because uh, we meet him in this. He's Mm-hmm. You know, of course, you know, there's no, unfortunately, there's no Usopp pirates and all that meeting on the hill. Justice He's working for in... Carrot, something <laughs> One Piece fans are always saying. <laughs> yeah, they always said, like, you know, Carrot should have joined the crew. And I agree, that that kid was a, a lovable little scamp. Right? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, I've I, I've had a lot of thoughts about Carrot joining the crew, but I think I'm reconsidering now. That kid, <laughs> I think he's of age. <laughs> To, to, to be a pirate, right? To be a pirate. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I, so uh, Jacob has this like self assuredness, which I really appreciate in, in his acting. I think he's great. It's another one of those where I'm like, damn, I, I'm blurring the line between are you even acting or are you just pretending to be yourself on stage? So, circling back around, I wondered how they were going to handle Usopp and everything. Um, also, Let's be honest. I think if I asked anybody, if I put a gun to their head and I was like, what's your least favorite arc in One Piece? Most people are either going to tell me fucking Foxy or Sierra Village. I uh, I can't lie. I don't really. I tend to skip it when I rewatch or I'll fast forward through some scenes because I'm like, I, I mostly because I want to get to Sanji. It, <laughs> yeah. It's so funny. Over the years, I've realized like how much hate this arc has. And it's not my favorite. And I've never had too much of a problem with it. Um, but it's definitely it's between buggy, which is a lot of fun, and it's before we get Sanji. So yeah, and it's uh, yes. There, and there's parts of it that drag, especially in the anime. I think revisiting it uh, in the anime recently, I was like, oh yeah, we. Oof. I think I think we're the here, issue we're, they're here for a while and there's no change yes. of scenery. You it drags a little bit, and then also people have issues with Usopp's character upon introduction, so the odds are kind of stacked against it. Um, I w- wish it could have the renaissance people being like, it's good actually, but it's, it's just fine. Sierra village is fine. Um, yeah. so I was wondering, I was like, okay, they've got to condense this somehow because there's no way that they can spend the amount of time that they do. Two episodes is a lot of time to be spending on this already. Yeah. Um, I <sighs> changing the set and the plot in a way I don't mind. I think, um, Kaya's. Kaya's like whole mansion has like Alice in Wonderland vibes to me, which is kind of cute. Um, it reminds, it, it feels very storybook, um, which then mm-hmm. plays off the fact that like Usopp is always telling her stories and stuff. It's very fantastical and whimsical. So I think that it's like a great scene, like a great setting for a place where Usopp is going to tell Kaya all these great fantastical adventures that are not true. Um, so she's got but all can this. Anyone- like- can anyone explain to me the plates hanging off the wall in the dining room? It's fantastic. It, it's supposed to be the, like, she has so much. It's stupid opulence. Like, it is the kind of opulence that rich people have that just is so much that it's ugly. Uh, 
That's what I took it as. Oh, it's my, it's like my room with all the stupid. Yeah, it's like your room yeah. with your mm. seven million Sanjis. You're like Jesus, dude. I'm just kidding. I okay. wish I had that many. <laughs> uh, almost threw me under the bus there. Yeah, it's um, yeah because it's similar with the uh, the closet with the clothes too. Yeah, exactly. Um, like I think every scene is meant to be like, look how much there is for just one person. And like Kuro has this resentment towards her. I mean, well, he's just evil. I'm gonna be real. Kuro doesn't have a tragic backstory. He just wants money and he's like, damn, I'm gonna take advantage of this little rich girl. Yeah. Um and And he's and he's too much of a of a you know, he 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 he, he was bitching and moaning too much about being a wanted pirate and he didn't want that life. Yeah. He's like, I just want to be rich. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, and then you also got the, like the, you know, the shipyard and all of that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that the set was really cool. I think I, uh, for as a set of episodes of entertaining television, enjoyable. I was like, okay, this works. You know, it's a little on the nose. Of course, the mysterious butler that shows up wants to kill you. I, again, I've only rewatched, I think, I, you know, I've, I've read Syrup Village once and I've watched Syrup Village once. So my memory of like exactly the events that happened is probably going to have to go to you because you're like my little, you're my encyclopedia. If I need to know, like, <laughs> how, how did this exactly happen? I'm like, Steve, can you open page 17 in your brain and let me know the dialogue on panel four, bubble, speech bubble five. <laughs> it's like, I'm not a weirdo. I'm a hypnotist. Um, sorry, <laughs> yeah, that was where's, the line you were looking for. Where's... Where is he? Where's Django? Django? I, Django, whatever. You know, in this modern age, having a character that's, you know, Michael Jackson, the pirate, I could see them kind of just like, yeah. Eh. I, I I think Seer Village was definitely one where they were like, if we want... To... So now that we have the context of the interview that you just listened to before this, I can understand, okay, I get why we had to condense what we did. Because I think their main... Budgetary concerns were sets and acting or actors. So Third Village has a lot of moving parts to it and a lot of different scenes. And they were like, well, we got to condense this. So Mm -hmm. they got rid of the Usopp Pirates, got rid of Django. Got got rid of the rest of the Black Cat Pirates. Yeah, they did. But you know what? It's like almost funnier to me if he's just like, yeah, I have these two stupid little butlers with me and my butler quest <laughs> butler quest for the uh yeah for this for the window cd rom um <laughs> one of the biggest uh, controversies or just biggest topics of this arc in the original story is just you know people will say that kuro's plan makes no sense it's asinine esoteric uh i, I feel like i'm one of the few people that like thinks it makes sense maybe i'm just silly i don't know like i'm calling you out here because pe- you at first didn't think it made sense but then maybe upon rewatching, you were like oh okay these, pu- these pieces oh 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 order. i'll get into the the tv show one because that one is taking oh, multiple viewings i'm sorry for i'm me sorry to, yeah that one is taking me multiple viewings to like realize what's because i think a lot of it's in the subtleties characters okay. don't outright say stuff but you're good i, thought, just, I thought you were making uh, like say i'm gonna call you out this is your call. No, post. please don't. <laughs> it's Smeev. Smeev Yurko. Um, <laughs> no, like in the original story, I think a lot of people say like, it's, it's like, what, why, it's like, why go through all the trouble staging a, a pirate attack where, you know, you're just going to kill everyone in the village anyway. It's like, no, he, Kuro never said kill everyone in the village. Uh, he just said like, rough the place up, kill, <laughs> like, you know, kill some. His intention was never to wipe out the entire village but to make it look convincing and so that, you know, you know, Django hypnotizes Kaya, so, you know, writes him, it's like writes Kuro into her will and then looks like she was killed by, and, make, and then kill her and make it look like she was killed by a pirate. And then he could, you know, it's like, and then I'm sure the village will go through lots of mourning, but then he'll be fine and then yeah. he'll get to live a lavish life. Yeah, it's it's a it's a bit much, and and what for is, him to expect all name? that to just work out just fine. Kuro of the thousand slaves. He's so slayful. 
And uh, yeah, and it just so happened this plan was going to go into effect the day the Straw Hats get there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's something else. But so in this version, they the, it's it's all about poisoning Kaya, making her sick, and I guess to the point where she eventually passes away, and the rights to the shipyard go to well, we're going to go to her because I guess she's about to turn eighteen. And then convince it, you know, convince her because she's unwell to hand over the rights to, you know, Kuro or Clahador, and then uh, then she, eventually she just gets keeps getting sicker and dies, because mm-hmm. uh, they really hit you on the head with it with this this blue goop. Um, Sarah and I, my roommate and I have this thing where if a character in a television show or I guess any piece of media, um, just has like a mysterious illness, we go, oh my God, she has illness disease. Um, and is, is Kaya not sick in the, in, in the manga, in the original manga? I don't remember. She's like sickly. She, she's sickly. And I think it's just, it's, it, it's due to like the. You know the the she stress has, of like she lo- has illness her disease. Family. That's yes. She has illness gotta, disease, and I think they were like, "Well, I guess we have to do some better writing than just being like, oh, she has illness yeah. disease.'" So they were it, like, it gets, "We can put these together." Yeah, like looking back, like it's one of the sloppy parts of that arc because especially like after Kuro's defeat, she's like, "Yeah, well, I guess I, you know, it's like I guess it had to do with the death of my parents, and I'm only gonna get better if I pick myself up and." start doing things again. And she it's had like, like huh. generalized anxiety and having a weird cat man living in our house was making it worse. That's... Yeah. Maybe she was allergic to cats. Too. <laughs> maybe <that's... laughs> yeah. Guys. So that's... that's it. But this one introduces the poisoning, which looks like Mountain Dew Baja blast. <laughs> Honestly, I was like, damn, I'd eat some of that shit. I don't give a shit. <laughs> uh, and then like the soup, geez, the soup just looked like cake icing. <laughs> It did. But it then, did. like, it introduced this whole aspect of kind of, I think the writers thought that there's, my guess is, there's not a whole lot of women uh, in this show, in this story. And the ones that do show up, we got to give them more of a character arc or more of an identity. Because I think Kaya um, doesn't do much. No. In she, the story. Nami has such a great relationship with Bibi. And I think it really fleshes her character out. Um, because sometimes, uh, characters like the cat burglar woman character sometimes tends to be distrustful towards other women is you know is, is a common stereotype so i think that they are perhaps trying to be like nami's la- not like that you know she is more three-dimensional um I-, I think it also helps flesh out nami's they get to be like nami hates rich people and you're like that's crazy i wonder why um they get both get to have this little character moment i will say um, my mom, we're, we're keeping up with the, uh, mom, mama Vero. That's a terrible, we're not going to call her that. It's Michelle. We're keeping oh. it with the Michelle Chronicles. Um, and I was like, okay, mom, what'd you think of these, these two episodes? Um, and you know what? She came out of this being like, my favorite character is now Kaya. And I was like, what? <laughs> I'm glad she's enough of a character now though, for her to be your favorite character. So she's indecipherable. So they did something with what, that. What a choice. But good for her. Yeah, it but Kaya has more of I will get probably get to that when we talk more about episode four. But mm-hmm. yeah, like there's this whole like Nami says it like point blank. It's like it's like yeah, it's like it's a Kaya can make her own choices and all that. I forgot these um, are two that I keep forgetting the episode is two different episodes. It's yeah. Just, I mean they kinda like they blend together so much that yeah. it'll probably be we'll probably just wind up start talking about episode four, so I'll remember when to make note of that, but, mm-hmm. but yeah, I was really kind of confused by the like Kuro's plan and initially, and it's taken me multiple viewings to realize like, okay, so they're always just going to keep poisoning her, but then Luffy eats all the the poison gruel, <laughs> the poison stew, uh. And I think like Butchie says something like, ah, oh, it's like fortuitous, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like, there goes like our, our slow burn plan. So they thought like, oh, well, it's midnight. Let's just kill her. <laughs> and I, I didn't get that at first. I thought initially it's like, oh, once it hits midnight, we just kill her. And it's like, uh, no, <laughs> that's, 
that that makes you yeah. look even more suspicious. Mm -hmm. But I think with uh, the Marines also being here, Kobe and Helmeppo, they were kind of like, Shit, I we kind of forgot have to, the Marines are in here. Oh my god! Yeah, I guess the Marines then act as a an accelerator for the plot or something. Yeah, but. which is more of a thing in episode four. The yeah. pirates are coming. <laughs> We're just talking about both of these at once. So. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I was just thinking. I, he reminded me of the Marines, and I went, "Oh yeah," because, um, <laughs> because uh, at this point, like what uh, Zoro was knocked out, throw down a wall, mm. uh, throw down a well. Uh, Luffy's incapacitated because he drank a bunch of poison, and yes. like Nami's like the only capable one right now, but she's like hiding. Um, uh, Remind me. Well, yes. Am I not remind me? Am I allowed to? What am I allowed to start being mean? What am I allowed to start bitching about stuff now? Is there something specific? Why was the Usopp arc the Zoro arc? Why? Why, why did Usopp's episodes? I guess my biggest grievance with this is it's supposed to be you literally even call it like earlier when we were recording. You didn't even call it Usopp's like arc. You called it like the Clahador episode or something. Um, I think I said like Usopp origin arc. Some, you, so whenever it was, it was I was like, oh, that's that's very uh, perfect for this because I, I get that it is expressed to us in the previous interview that it is expensive to do flashbacks, um, and there's a lot of Usopp's backstory. I guess revolves around the the kids that he has. Uh, like, not his actual kids, but, you know, the, the kids that follow him around and stuff. And in mm -hmm. this one, all we get is, oh, Usopp is just this annoying fucking kid in town and no one's going to miss him when he leaves. Which I think there's way more nuance to him in that. In in the manga, whatever. Um, yeah, it's almost like you could, like, yeah, like you could, was it, set, uh, set it on a, on a dime? Is that the phrase? I don't know. Like, Usopp kind of became, like, the town, like, rooster, you mm -hmm. know, <laughs> which, and, uh, I don't know. It we get Zoro's flashback in the middle of this as his mm -hmm. like motivation to climb out of the well. Mm -hmm. Very I, Dark Knight Rises. <laughs> I haven't seen that movie. Um, but I think maybe he rises out of a well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Very astute. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> he also has a flashback about wanting to be the best Batman. How many other Batmans? I mean, is whatever. I'm sure he's 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 probably on a on a quest to be the bat. Anyway, <laughs> I would have loved. I just I think there are better places to put that, um, and I feel like it takes away for uh, like everybody else is having some character development in this arc, and I'm like, where's Usopp's moments? I yeah. I feel I, like I I'm I'm jumping ahead to preview for the next episode, but I feel like Usopp and Sanji sort of get mostly Usopp but a little of Sanji they kind of they're only in this for so 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 long they kind of are taking a back burner in their character development the whole season the whole show feels like the Zoro Nami Luffy Kobe show yeah. honestly I could have done without marine interaction if at you know we get more of the straw hats I realize that they want to have an overarching villain for the, you know, an overarching feeling of chase that we get mm -hmm. from the Marines that then, you know, we get a climax later. But I'm totally going off the rails. I am kind of annoyed with what they did to Usopp. I think Jacob okay. really show like shines in his performances. He gets some like silly so, so little moments later during Gratier, but I feel like Usopp, unfortunately, just gets thrown to the wayside. Yeah, his flashback is very brief. I mean, it's very brief in the original story too. But I, I, I don't get the sense that, like, the the town, while, while annoyed with him, like he's such a crucial part of the village. You know, mm -hmm. because one of the biggest things is when he chooses to leave. Uh, yeah. the town's like oh there's no Usopp today and like the people that were like throwing pots and pans at him the day earlier are starting to feel bad yeah um, it's uh, yeah and Usopp I don't think he does finally have his moment where he like is brave 
but mm-hmm. it feels it, it just it doesn't feel as like uh i don't know earned like i know like usopp never really kind of put that much of a dent into like kuro or any of the other black cat pirates in the original story but like there is this moment you know where he in the original story where he stands between kaya and mm-hmm. uh and kuro to like point to point a gun at kuro um but like usopp's moment of bravery or just like the moment where his marksmanship comes into play is when he takes out jango along with zoro mm-hmm. uh to save kaya that's his moment of bravery and i feel like he doesn't get that big moment kaya i feel like gets that moment it's kind of like uh it does she does i i it, i you know it's kind of foolish, though. She just, like, grabs, like, a knife and just thinks, like, I'm done being afraid or whatever. And she runs yeah. out from under a table and then immediately gets caught. It's like, what do you think was going to happen? Yeah. But I think she needed that moment for herself. But Usopp fires, like, a, you know, he fires a shot from a slingshot at Kuro, but Kuro catches it. And then just immediately just, like, smacks him away. It, it I, I think that's his moment of bravery, but it just doesn't come off as, no, like, Usopp kind of overcoming his fears. It just comes more like it's like, oh yeah, you're useless. <laughs> and I, it's it in comparison to again, we had this conversation last episode where we're like, how do we, um, how do we navigate critiquing this as a show without having it also be here's every single thing that they changed. Um, and I don't mind them making changes, like again, changing Kaya's whole thing, changing the curl plot. I didn't really mind. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of people, like, a lot of praise that this adaptation is getting is, like, kind of tur- turning this story into, like, kind of more of, like, a horror <laughs> kind of theme, which is being trapped in this house with, like, yeah. a bunch of crazed murderers. Yeah. I g- <laughs> you can hear me not being convinced, I guess. <laughs> um, I It's, again, without the context of the original, I'm like, yeah, this is probably fine and great. And then... I just you said it best with like the the villagers. We don't we don't get the conclusion of like the next day the villagers being oh where's like Usopp because they do mm-hmm. truly care about him, and I don't know. I will say I will say this it kind of because I think one of the biggest controversies coming out of this adaptation of this arc is they killed Mary. <laughs> they did. They killed Greg. <laughs> <laughs> God, yeah, it's crazy how much the actor. That plays Mary when all dressed up like that looks so much like Greg. I did think it was. I was like, "That's Umphy right there." That's crazy. Um, which I don't know. It, to me, it wasn't a big deal because when I originally read the series, I thought Mary was dead. Yeah, I. It was fine to me. I was like, "Okay, whatever." They're going for like a little darker. It makes sense to follow through on this. Um, but but the one thing that's kind of crazy is like, um. Now, and I wonder if it was like maybe if this was played into or not. Maybe I kind of missed something here, but like Kai is left with nothing at this. Like she has nobody left, and I thought maybe that would be a reason why Usopp would stay, and maybe that's implied because in the original story, Usopp is also heading out on his own mm-hmm. uh, foolishly, and then the Luffy's just like, "What are you doing? Just come with us. Yeah. Stop it already." And I'm wondering if. Usopp felt the need to stay behind is because Kaya was by herself. And Kaya's mm-hmm. pretty encouraging, I think, to Usopp here. Um, In more ways but, than one. Yeah, because uh, they kiss. I It was so funny. I'm sitting there with watching with Sarah, and I go, are they about to kiss right now? Like, making a joke, and then they do, and we were like, what? Um, good for them. I, I feel like so many fans just, like, consider their romance to be canon- uh for what it is um i have thinking of how to express this i feel like they do that and it parallels like yasop a little bit also leaving being like you know a real pirate can't resist the call of the sea and he's like you know as much as i have feelings for her i gotta go be my own person um Mm -hmm. i I'm like, sure, I guess. Um, I don't know. I have complicated feelings about Yasop. I, I'm not one of those people that's like, oh my God, he's the worst person ever. But, you know. 
Yeah, I think you got to understand within the, it's it's kind of like within the context of the story, he's not an awful person. If this was the real world, he'd be an awful person, right? Like that's, exactly, ex- yeah. yeah. Um, the, the, the you know the call of adventure is supposed to be so grand that you leave your sick and dying wife and child at home, but uh, who knows? I I always thought that she got sick after he left. Yeah, yeah. Did they do the line where he says, like, Dad said, if he, well, well, they did the line, because I think it's in the manga, isn't it, where he's like, Dad said that once you're better, he'll come back or whatever, which is, I remember I saw some people talking about that recently, where they were like, I can't believe he would say that to his kid, and I was like, he's lying, he didn't say it, he's saying it, and it's like, yeah. Usopp is lying there to be like, Mom, Not- can you please get better, like, I think it was. I think it was along the lines of like you have to get better because then Dad's gonna come back and he's gonna take us with him. Yeah. Okay. And that's. I think it's. It's. It's like that. Yeah. yeah. I. I just... Also, yeah. Usopp is is, is lying <laughs> to try to make his mom feel better. I'm like he. Most of Usopp's lies are like not malicious. They are done in, in a way to like bring comfort to the people around him. He's like you know wants to tell stories to Kaya because she's so lonely and she also you know she. It gets him, you know, the positive attention. He tells these lies to his mom, hoping that, you know, as a child does, it'll make your, you know, mom feel better if you're like, look, I got this magic bean or some shit, you know, like the kind of the mm-hmm. thought process. Um, and then he's lying to the villagers because to him it's a game. Um, and that's also, I don't know. I see Usopp as this like very sympathetic. He's a, he's a child. He wants attention. He wants affection. He doesn't have any parents. He doesn't have a family. He wants the people of the village to like give him the affirmation that his mom did where she would listen to his stories. And so, I, I just And so then naturally other children follow in suit. I'm totally, this is turning into just like ranting about people who don't like Usopp actually. <laughs> We've got no, off it's topic. Good. No, it's great. This I feel is, like I don't get to talk is... about Usopp that often because he hasn't really done a whole lot lately, but I think he really nah. does have a lot of nuance. And then when so. people, I feel like most of the, I feel like these days, the average conversation of Usopp is people just being Mimi and just saying God Usopp and all this yeah. stuff. When uh, I, there's there's a lot of nuance, uh, nuances about Usopp that I enjoy, but those kind of come later in the mm-hmm. story and that are adapted later in this season of the show mm-hmm. that I'll probably get into later. Um, but just like the show, let's totally take the attention away from Usopp. What do you think about Zoro's backstory? Um, I actually thought everyone involved in that did an amazing job. Um, I thought his child actor was really great. Um, I, sorry to make can you, there were times where I was like, oh, I find this child's performance more emotional and more moving than like mostly anything that i've seen like can you doing i wish i did the kid's name be... uh let's see <laughs> you can go look it uh, up M- maximilian lee piazza i thought piazza. you were making a joke for a second there no that's his name that kind of rules shout out to maximilian um yeah, I, I, I found it to be pretty emotional. Um, I'm also, you know, on on things that they would change for a Western audience. I wonder if they don't. They just say it's an accident. They don't say that she fell down some stairs because I think people would find that comical um, because most people play that off as a joke. Um, mm-hmm. So I think maybe was, I, I, I didn't hate that choice being like, yeah, there was an accident. You, you, you get the uh, the sadness of the fact that it was such a like a such a small accent like such a such a random thing it doesn't matter doesn't have to be big pirates didn't come and kill her it's just anything that could happen to anyone you know Mm -hmm. she dies and like that's how life goes and it's unfair um and yeah that's the theme that's the theme of of zoro's backstory yet i don't know when people still theory craft or something that she killed herself or, or I don't know, they assassinated her family or her dad killed her. And it's like, no, the, the takeaway from this backstory is that nothing in life is is guaranteed. Yeah. You know, some, sometimes people die and, yeah, not for any reason. It just happens, you yeah. know. She doesn't get to and, achieve her dream, not not out of not being strong, not out of not uh, any anything like that. It's just like that life is so precious and fragile like that which i then feel like zoro turns into uh he kind of has the role of like 
definitely like a protector of the crew him and him and sanji but i think especially him um sanji does his own version of caring for the crew through like cooking and all of that but zoro has to be like that brute strength is what he sees he needs to be the strongest so that like things like this can't happen to people in his life again um so i don't know i thought the acting was really cool i um kawina's actress was also really wonderful i really liked her um Mm -hmm. i i don't know it was a better part of the yeah, episode. Was- I just wish that it was maybe somewhere. Like I, I, I was also like this. This part of him is so heavy and so emotional and so intrinsical to his character. Why is it being used as his motivation to climb a well? I feel like he doesn't. The emotional stakes aren't there. I feel like this is something specifically reserved for like I don't know maybe some context before or during the Mihawk fight. That's yeah, I th- I think the problem is this is told so briefly in the manga, and I think yeah. the anime found a really good place for it. But then again, anime is like twenty three minutes, you know. Yeah, it's, I think there was really nowhere else you could have put this in with uh, with us in hindsight, knowing how the rest of this uh, season is paced out. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I I feel like it it did take a little bit away from the rest of the things going on in this story here but i feel like i'm ranting what about what how about you what what did you think or or are you just going to echo what i said no like i definitely have some similar thoughts here but i think otherwise like it still kind of sticks to landing you know you know luffy and kuro kind of you know have different ideologies of course like luffy's just like hey and it's like you don't have ambition I kind of, it's a shame that we don't have like the line about like Usopp is more of a pirate, is a better pirate than you. Yeah. Um, But like there's only so much time and there's only so much dialogue you could put in without it getting too clunky. Sure. Uh, But it's, uh, yeah, I, 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 I always saw him like, oh, geez, are they going to, like, are they going to murder Kaya in cold blood and then like try to pin this on the straw hats but mm-hmm. they didn't do that i thought like, oh, that was well, like the that, perfect that's what, they were, that's what they were going to do they said that did they yeah that was that was kuro kuro said it's convenient that there's pirates in here they even like tell the marines there are other pirates like running around and that like Kaya's in danger okay it's there were and- it's okay there were a lot of lines where like it, it was if you weren't like less you know you can miss one line that kind of changes the course of things so for sure you're okay um uh, and oh uh, we want to talk about like the mary too or before we do yeah. that there's something there's another storyline that i totally forgot about uh and that uh buggy is a reoccurring character now through the story and through him we're introduced to arlong and the fishman very early yes i and- I have no strong feelings about introducing Arlong early. Um, I, I'm going to be real. I totally forgot that this happens. Like you reminded me of it. I was like, oh yeah, that did happen. Which perhaps, you know, we watched. I haven't, it's been a couple days since I watched those episodes, but. Because um, uh, the the map to the Grand Line is becoming the MacGuffin of the season. Everyone mm-hmm, wants it, including mm-hmm. Arlong. Um, I just I was wondering, I'm like, oh, is it too early to introduce him? I kind of feel like that's what you send like, you know, Kurobi or Chew out for, uh, and for him to show up. So seriously, oh my god, oh my god, you, are we, are we blowing this? But I don't know. I think it still works out. I think it's just. I just realized I'm like, wow, this is so much to like juggle. <laughs> yeah. In two episodes, and of course, you know, there's the. I feel stuff like they Co- got a lot of Usopp's arc. To then fit in other things that would be told in between arcs that they don't really have the time for. Again. Yeah. That would be, you know, Zoro's backstory. Anything with Kobe and Garp. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I was, I was surprised. They really fought for the Kobe and Garp stuff. They really wanted that in there. <laughs> I, I am like... I, I feel bad that I'm not the biggest fan of it, but it just doesn't really do a whole lot for me. Some people that I've spoken to love it. They're like, this is my favorite part of the season, and I'm very happy for them. I just, I'm like, hey, it's not I don't know. Thing. I have Zoomer brain. I was like, damn, I got to make sure. I got. I have to force myself not to look at my phone during those parts, and that's all I got to say. <laughs> so, aren't you, aren't you enthralled by a good game of Go? 
you can go. I was gonna say something mean. I don't actually say something mean. Yeah, I was gonna say something mean. <laughs> go <too>. away. <laughs> yeah, you can. That, those scenes can go away. Um, which is crazy because I actually really liked Kobe. Um, as a character, I just was like, I don't know. I, I kept finding myself being like, "What is the point? <laughs> Why are we here?" What well, What I think is really great though is uh, when the uh, the Straw Hats get the Mary. Uh, and mm-hmm. God, I was about to go into like or something I didn't like, but uh, I'd say when something I didn't like. Go, it's not necessarily them. I didn't like it, but it's different than what I'm used to. Yeah, Luffy was all about you know because Nami and Zoro are ready to steal a ship, and Luffy's like, no, you don't. It's like you don't steal a ship, you know, because the ship is very important. So then, like Luffy just becomes all about like, <laughs> acquiring one the right way through purchasing, which. I, I wouldn't necessarily say I'm like, no, Luffy would steal. No, but I just remember Luffy showing up at Kai's Mansion, the original story, and be like, hey, do you got a ship? Yeah, like, can I have a boat, please? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's fine. I, 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 I accepted him being like, we can't steal this one because it's a crewmate or whatever. I'm like, yeah, okay. That's that's fine. You've got to. Yeah. It plays into the ongoing good pirate theme, which I could give or take, but I would say at least it's consistent with his character. Yes. Um. I just like it. It's just interesting because they're, you know, they're introduced to the Mary so early. Like Luffy's immediately attached to it. Mm-hmm. Um, instead of just Mary being like, oh, hey, I have a ship. <laughs> and it's still Mary's ship, but Mary's dead. I think um, the Luffy being kind of attached to the Mary and like feeling that sense with her, I feel like is a bit of fan service, not in like a gratuitous fan service kind of way, but in a way where it's like, we because again th- we i can tell what's what's in there for the longtime fans and i can tell what's in here for new new viewers and this is like a mm-hmm. moment of like um here we, we know how special mary becomes and like we know yes. what she does for them um and i i you're gonna think i'm a little crazy for this i have been viewing part of this is not the intent of the, the the point of the series, but this is done. I've sort of viewed it this way where I made it like a little kind of heightened my own experience. Um, I have been viewing the live action as like a reincarnation of the story, literally in a way where like, this is being told in, in like a, we, cause the, the anime doesn't really have to do this, but the, this is so far removed from the original manga and the original context of the story that it knows so much of what's coming ahead that it knows the seeds to plant for like things that are fate or things that are going to happen or like emotional stakes that are going to be there later. Um, And so, yeah, I guess in a world where all of this is reincarnated and they're following on a very similar, but slightly different path, Luffy would have this sensation of like, this is a special ship to me. Um, And that heightens it for me. Um, This is probably not the right way to view television or whatever, but it has been like how I'm making peace with some changes and like some, some things. I guess um, it's definitely not what they were going for, but like, I think that's the be- one of the best ways to like describe the context of the story. And you can tell me I'm crazy now. <laughs> no, I think that's a good way of looking at it, but it just, um, yeah, if Mary's going to be dead at the end of this, the, the, the person Mary's going to be dead at the end of this arc, then Luffy has to have that connection with the ship uh, from the beginning. Um, and I like it. It's, I think. For sure. Yeah. I, I don't know. Whatever. It has one of the best uh, jokes is uh, when Luffy's like looking at the, uh, you know, the, the head of uh, the Mary, uh, mm-hmm. and Usopp says something, and Luffy says, "You can talk." <laughs> I do like that. Yes, which is again foreshadowing. You know, it's it's yeah. the we as the we. It's I like it. It works as such a good like double joke because people who know the series are like, "Ha ha, uh, yes, she can." And people who've never experienced it are like, "Ha ha, no, of course boats can't talk." You know, mm-hmm. it works. Yes, both exactly. Ways. I think that's a it really excellent piece way. of writing. And, so. uh, but then, like, the the gang finally set and sail on this ship. Uh, mm-hmm. And this is the first use of oh, We Are. I cried. I, I was like, I'm a shill. <laughs> I'm a little fucking baby. I, because I, I literally remember saying to Sarah earlier, I was like, I wonder if they got to put We Are in here at all. And they were like, no, they're probably not going to because it's its own original thing. And then we hear that, and I, I was. Oh, I was, I was misty eyed. 
I was surprised they didn't save it till like the end of the season, mm-hmm. but putting it here, yeah, I think it was I a good spot. It was I think perfect. it's well earned. Yeah, for for getting the ship, for getting Mary, because this is like, you know, like this is the iter- this is the first iteration of the crew, really. Because uh, mm-hmm. uh, Luffy, Zoro, and Nami kind of feel like a like a trio up until this point, uh, mm-hmm. both in this and in the original. So. Uh, yeah, and it's just it's cool to see, and like everyone kind of gets settled in. Luffy, you know, has his favorite spot. Uh, Nami's kind of steering the ship, and like she looks at her compass and realizing where it's going, and she has like a sense of dread. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, Usopp snacking, and Zoro finds a place to sleep, and yeah, it feels like yes, very lived in. It feels very it strong. They immediately found their their respective homes in it, so yeah, it was cute. I liked it. When- but we got there. <laughs> um, like I said, I think the still. Oh, the, go ahead. The 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 Garp stuff happens at the end of episode four, right? Um. Yeah, that's the cliffhanger it leaves off on. Mm-hmm. With the revelation that, uh, yeah, uh, Garp is Luffy's grandpa, searching after him, and uh, and that's where we leave off. It was fine. I mean, again, I, I if if they were gonna include Garp, they had to include that bit. Like that's you had to you yeah. had to know that. So I thought that it's was like a, another... a good cliffhanger to get people to. Yeah, that's the thing. Because you know that's the that's the streaming model is you gotta mm-hmm. end everything on like a nice hook and uh, one more like episode. This... Yeah, because like otherwise this like just ends like satisfactory in you know in a way where it's like huh, it's like everything's kind of tied up here and they're on an adventure. Uh, so they needed something. So I'm not, uh, not not at all surprised that they dropped that this soon. Yes. It's it works. Uh, my my mom said that she was like, of course his he's related to a marine. She's like, I rolled my eyes. It was cheesy. I was like, okay, mom. <laughs> the the the, yeah, the but... normies didn't like it. That's what we learned. <laughs> mm-hmm. But this was a big deal to One Piece fans back in 2007. <laughs> was it? I, I oh yeah. I so I feel like I I actually don't remember. I think I went into I feel like I went in knowing that they were related. I managed to actually keep the Ace Roger thing completely unspoiled almost almost entirely up until the reveal. Wow. Anyway. That was that was my first week on the One Piece podcast. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh. What was, what, what was, was my that first like? Episode. Were, you, uh, were you very excited? Did you like it? Did you hate it? I need to know. It was shocking, I remember. Uh and it was like you know, it, was, it kind of felt like, wow, like crazy pressure to be on this episode of this podcast talking about something very pivotal <laughs> so to the story. That's cute. I came on and it was the uh, chapter where they pretended to be, uh, they played chicken with a fireball. So it's just <laughs> equally as important, honestly. So The worst trio. That's the episode I remember. <laughs> the word, yes, exactly. They were. I, w- I was going to say the hot dog episode and I was like, you're not going to know what the fuck I'm talking no, about. No, I know exactly what we're <laughs> talking about here. <laughs> Um, but yeah do, oh, like overall do you feel like this do you think this improved the original story because you know with syrup village being s- such a uh, watchability wise yes like, for Usopp's character no that's and that's maybe what they were going I don't know I my, I feel like my boy Usopp just you know he could have had a little bit more but it is what it is. Yeah, I kind of feel like he joins just because, like, well, that's what because happens. Because nobody in Usopp town joins. likes him and his people, you know, I don't know. Well, I think it's just, like, like, I don't think there was, like, enough kind of, like, a, oh, yeah, you're one of us now, you know? Mm-hmm. I, I, because I, I feel like, you, like, no one questions it because, like, everyone knows the story. Like, yeah, of course Usopp joins. He's one of the straw hats. But I don't think there was, like, enough incentive in the story to be like, yeah, come on. You know, it's like, we need you, yeah. you know? And, uh, but yeah, I just don't think that, and like, ah, like he didn't have like a cool little marksman scene, you know, where he really got to show off. He just shot at Kuro once and Kuro caught it. Yeah. <laughs> Which made Kuro seem <laughs> much cooler. But I don't know. I'm I'm curious if people like this adaptation of the story arc more than the original. Yeah. Let us know. Well, anything well, else? 
No, I think. I feel like we, we weren't funny. I have to be funnier in Spirit of Usopp. But you know what? He he wasn't that silly funny. He wasn't my silly goofy guy for most of it. Well, I think you said plenty of things about the, about Kuro at the beginning of this uh, segment here that I, I, I think the people will enjoy. That's fair. He was cunty. There's a really funny TikTok edit I, I saw of like them changing him, like doing his little arm chops and making it look like he was boging. And I'm like, yep, that's <laughs> that's him. So, yeah. Feels weird for me to say it, but I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you can say he's cunty. It's Captain fine. Cunty of the Thousand Plans. Yeah. We're not titling the episode that. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> All right. Why don't we round off this show? <laughs> This has been Opla. The... <laughs> We've just Go on. Yeah. Describe it. <laughs> the, uh, the show where S- S- me and I talk about the One Piece live action. Um, I hope you I... have. Hmm? Am I not even Smeeve anymore? Am I just Smee? <laughs> I started calling you Smee because it's a pirate name. <laughs> I'm Captain Hook. <laughs> Can yes, we... you are. Thank you. Um, Smee and I, can you do a Smee voice? Terribly now. Like, the captain. <laughs> right away, captain. Smee, I've got to close out the episode. I can't do <laughs> Smee. Oh, we're leaving this in. Bring the podcast back to its conclusion. <laughs> Anyway, um, if you hear that distant ticking sound in the background, that is not a crocodile. That is uh, the episode telling us that we need to end. Anyway, um, thank you so much for listening. Um, Me, where can the good people find you? What else do we have to say? Well, we should thank uh, you know we should thank Zach for coming on our segment. Uh, You know, and of course, special thanks to Stephen Maeda for taking the time to chat with us. uh been looking forward to that for a long time and uh i think also we should take this time also thank uh the writers and the actors for bringing this show to life as well as uh we continue to support you and also congrats on the season two i don't think we talked about that at the top oh yeah that's right we didn't even say that all at the top of the show um it's old yeah that was yeah it's old hat but yeah uh oda himself through a through his transponder snail announced season two so uh i look forward to that as soon as uh a deal is made for uh writers and actors uh they're what make this show so all right uh and where could the good people find us um they can find you at steve yurko on twitter or wherever else social media takes you in the wind and you can blue skies popping off yeah we should we should see we should seek bluer skies and steve where can people find me uh your ginkgo crown arts on twitter uh and then just ginkgo crown everywhere else so true and uh where's where's the podcast at oh it's at onepiecepodcast.com uh wherever you listen to podcasts spotify uh apple music uh, no apple Podcasts, i should say uh one piece podcast uh Subscribe to us on Patreon and get some extra goodies and kick some money back towards us for making all these shows possible. Uh, send us an email at onepiecepodcast at gmail.com. I think we should start There's- splitting the episodes into three minute segments and posting them on TikTok. Um, just, you know, as that's the wave. Are we that hip? You think we could do it? No. No, they would be so mean to us on there. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> the Never Zoomers mind. are awful. Yeah. Um, and also, scare me. it's a great MCR song. <laughs> <laughs> and you were saying, Maji. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Yep. Well, Goodbye, you could listen everybody. to you could listen to our regular episodes to get our Skype phone number if you want to call us on that. But yeah, uh, next time we'll cover more of the series. Uh, finally, getting into uh, the Buratier. Yeah, the the Sanji heads in the room are really excited. We both have Sanji shrines, so it's going to be yeah. a long episode. I thought you said we both have Sanji heads. <laughs> Uh, yes, mine's my eyebrows are very curly, and you have a lot of hair covering half your face. I do. You do. Very <laughs> handsome. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, <laughs> rev up those fryers because we'll catch you next time. Bye. Later. <laughs>